Hi, I'm G. Matoka here with another product review for HobbyFanatic.com. Today we're taking a look at the GE Geospring Hybrid Hot Water Heater. This is a 50 gallon hot water heater that uses heat pump technology to heat the water in addition to electric heating elements like our traditional hot water heater. That's where the hybrid comes from. It's got a little of both. Um, if you're not familiar with these units, the, what's going on is they basically have a heat pump, which is sort of like an air conditioner, working in reverse to heat the water. Turns out that's a much more, not efficient, but uses much less electricity than a traditional electric heating element. Traditional electric heating elements are actually extremely efficient in terms of converting electricity into heat, but it turns out pulling heat from the surrounding air requires much less energy overall. So basically, we have a lot of early 20th century technology, frankly, put, it, it put to a new use to save you some money. How much? Well, GE rates this unit at consuming 1,856 kilowatt hours a year. Compared to a traditional hot water heater, electric hot water heater, which clo consume close to 5,000 kilowatt hours a year, or maybe a little more, it's a pretty substantial savings, over 3,000 kilowatt hours a year. If you're like me, I pay 12 cents a kilowatt hour on average here um, after taxes and all the fees. So I'm saving, have the potential to save almost $400 a year with this unit. Well, the ratings are great, but how well does it really work in the real world? Well, uh, November was the first full month that I had the GE installed. Uh, and, and that month I used 825 kilowatt hours compared to 1108 kilowatt hours the prior year. So I had a savings of 283 kilowatt hours on that one billing period. Now, that's very close to the estimated uh, savings for this unit. And it turns out here in North Texas, November is kind of an ideal month for that comparison because I run no AC or heat during that month. So it really brings out the differences in changes that I make to appliances like this. Um, so I'm very happy with that. So that's the good part. But there has to be a drawback, right? Well, sure. The most obvious and immediate is the upfront cost. Uh, this unit retails for $1,400 from GE right now. Now, that price has come down over the last few years, so keep an eye on it. It'll probably continue to fall as these units become more popular. But when you compare that to $300 roughly for your standard electric hot water heater, it's a pretty substantial difference. But they do go on sale from time to time. I purchased this unit this October for $999 shipped free from straight from GE. So keep an eye out, they do go on sale. Plus there's a $300 federal tax credit on Energy Star compliance and this appliance does qualify. So there's an additional year basically that's going to take off your, your to recoup your costs. Um, also check with your local utility company. Uh, my local utility company offers a whopping $37.50 for an Energy Star rated hot water heater your uh, utility company may offer more, so it's definitely worth checking on. And now that you know the numbers, you can really start thinking about whether this kind of a unit is right for you. Well, first off, if you have a, currently have a gas hot water heater, forget it. The gas is so inexpensive to heat with that this unit is probably going to end up costing you more money. Um, if, you have, if you're on propane, I don't know, you'd have to run the numbers and see if you'd save any money with this unit. You may. Um, but if you currently have an electric hot water heater, you probably ought to consider this one either as an immediate replacement or for your next hot water heater. But there are some differences. Remember I said this thing worked like an air conditioner in reverse? Well, it really does, and a lot of those characteristics of air conditioning units come along with this unit. Namely, that's noise, cold air, remember we're, in this case we're using the heat, we're spitting out cold air, um, Condensation, water in the form of condensation, and a filter. All those things are present in this unit. Now, the noise comes primarily from the fans. All the noise comes from the, from the heat pump, obviously. But there are some fans in there that move air through the unit. Um, there's some noise from the compressor as well. It kind of sounds to me like a, like a server or a high-end computer, you know, a very noisy high-end computer, because they have fans of similar size, and they move a lot of air through them. Um, it's not, it's not really loud, uh, but it is noticeable. GE says it's 58 decibels. Now, that's kind of hard to relate to for most people. Here in the, I have mine installed in the garage. I can obviously hear it. 
My daughter's room is right on the other side of this wall. Believe me, if she had ever heard the noise in her room, I would know about it. So it's not that big a deal, but if you want, if you're installing this in an interior living space or someplace close to a living space where you may be sitting and watching TV or something like that, it's something you might want to consider. Second is that cold air. Remember, since we're pulling heat from the air around the unit, we're left with well, cold air. That has to go somewhere. GE recommends you install this unit in a, a, vol a room with a volume of at least 700 cubic feet to provide adequate air for it to work with. Um, me, I'm installing in a garage, it's not a problem, but if you're installing it in a smaller space, like a utility closet or, or a utility room, um, you may have to ha add some additional ventilation, like louvers to the doors and that sort of thing, to get some additional airflow. Now that cold air is going to go somewhere. If you live in a cold climate, that may be an issue. You're going to be fighting with your central heater, uh, with your air conditioner, with your uh, hot water heater. Here in a warmer climate like Texas, it's actually a benefit. Um, this hot water heater does take the edge off of, uh, my, off of my garage on a warm day. Next is the filter. Uh, the unit has a filter on top, just like an air conditioner. Um, it's pretty easily replaced, but it's something you need to consider when you have the unit installed. Make sure you have access, make sure your pipes are not blocking the filter, which pulls straight up out of the top of the unit. Um, it's a permanent filter, so you don't have to buy new filters, and you just simply clean it off. I've had this unit installed now for almost two months, and I've never had uh, to clean it. In fact, I looked at it today, and it's still fairly clean. So I don't think it's something that's going to be a huge issue. Um, also, there is a, an indicator light on the front of the panel right here, which comes on when the filter needs to be cleaned. So you have some notification. You don't have to go check it every, every month or whatever. Um, and finally, is that condensation. Um, again, just like an air conditioner, there's going to be some water that comes off this unit. Now, there's a PVC tube that comes out of the back of the unit, and that water is going to have to go somewhere. Now, if you're in a modern home, you pro your hot water heater is probably installed with a, in a pan with an overflow tube that's routed outside or into a drain in your home. I simply ran that tube down into that same drain, and I haven't had any issues. Uh, but if you're in a basement and you don't have a pan or something underneath your hot water heater, keep in mind, when you buy this, that water has to go somewhere. So, something to consider. May it, it may add slightly to your installation costs. Now, as far as controls on this unit, you've got an indicator that comes on when the filter needs to be cleaned. You have a dedicated button for the high demand mode. So if you have people coming into town, you can put it into high demand for a day or two, uh, and that will use the electric heating elements to heat the water more quickly. Uh, a vacation mode, so if you're out of town, it'll lower the temperature down to keep the water from freezing, uh, but save you some additional energy. You can lock the controls. There's the energy menu, which sets the mode, the operational mode of the unit, and a stop cold air button. So if you're working in the same space with the unit and you're a little chilly, punch that, it'll shut down the uh, heat pump for a little while. Okay, this unit has four modes of operation. It has the e-heat mode, which GE claims is the most efficient. It has your hybrid mode, which is the default that the unit ships with. It has a high demand mode, and it has a standard mode. The e-heat and the hybrid mode primarily use the heat pump to heat the water, but in a period of high demand, they may kick in those electric heating elements to provide faster recovery. The high demand mode just kicks those elements in even faster. Um, and the standard mode turns off the heat pump completely and just uses the resistive heating elements. I'm not sure exactly why you would use that. Maybe if there was a malfunction or if it was extremely cold, uh, you could just put it in standard mode and let it run like that. Now, in terms of that recovery time and uh, using the heat pump versus the electric heating elements, there's a pretty substantial difference. If I draw down a, a, quite a bit of water from this, like say take a long shower, um, it, that, that heat pump will run for about two hours to restore the tank uh, to full heat. By comparison, with the resistive heating elements, it could do that same job in about half an hour. So that's a substantial difference. I was a little concerned about this when I first installed the unit. I didn't really know if that would work in our family the way our family uses a hot water heater, and it really has. Um, we've never had any problems with not, not being enough hot water. Now, when I learned about these modes, I immediately had some questions. Um, namely, what mode was used when the government testing was done, and also what temperature was the water at the time. 
Uh, I found a great website called advancedenergy.org where they did some real world testing on this unit. Not only did they run the government protocol, but they ran it at a couple of temperatures and then they had some additional protocols which represented different types of demand cycles. Um, as well as a test in a much smaller than the, than the recommended volume, GE recommended volume. So if you had to run this thing in a small enclosed space, how poorly would it perform? They did all these tests. I highly recommend you read the, the report. I've got a link below here, advancedenergy.org. There's a lot of really juicy data in there. If you're a nerd like me, it really gives you some insight into how this unit operates. Um, but one of the most interesting things in there to me was the fact that the government tests are conducted at a water temperature of 135 degrees. A lot of people run much cooler temperature of 120 degrees to prevent, help prevent scalding risk. Um, that's a big difference and it turns out that they conducted the uh, government test at that lower temperature of 120 degrees, they found an additional 200 kilowatt hours a year of savings. Uh, bringing this thing down to, into the neighborhood of 1,600 kilowatt hours a year uh, operation. So there's some additional savings there. Also, the surprising thing was there is very little difference uh, in their test scenarios and in the government test scenarios between the e-heat and the standard hybrid mode. Uh, neither test, I guess, is rigorous enough to cause the electric heating elements to kick in under those test conditions. So there's very little difference between the two. Okay, so I highly recommend you read that report if you're really into the numbers. Uh, it's a great, it's a great, great review. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, the size of these two units. Um, this is the unit here is the GE is six feet tall and basically 22 inches in diameter, a little bit wider with some of these panels on the front they put here. Um, now, the size is actually important. Well, obviously, some of the volume is the heat pump, but the tank itself is 45 inches by 22 inches. That works out to a little under 10 cubic feet. Uh, this unit that I replaced, the volume is about eight and a half cubic feet. So the volume of the water is the same in both. So it means the difference is the insulation. It turns out this unit has about 3.2 cubic feet of insulation and this has about 1.8 cubic feet of insulation. So there's a significant difference, almost twice as much insulation in, in the geospring uh, compared to your typical builder grade hot water heater. So some of the efficiency is coming from that. Not, not much, not nearly as much as the difference in the technology, but some of it is coming from uh, the fact that this is a well-insulated and well-made unit. All right, there's my review of the GE geospring. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I hope you purchase one of these units. I think pretty soon everybody's going to be having one of these because the payoff is just tremendous. Uh, and immediate, and you're buying a well-made unit. All right, thank you very much.